Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats. I would like to begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen speaking nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. It's a privilege and an honor to live and work alongside them every single day. Chamber Chats are made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. And as always, we are in the cozy confines of the podcasting studio at Czech Television. You know, there's things that you hear and they kind of stick in your mind as being this really profound, remarkable statement. One of those for me is when somebody said to me, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our own seabed on this planet, which is two thirds of the Earth's surface. And I believe the first person that ever said that for me to hear it was my guest today on Chamber Chats. Dr. Kate Moran is the president and CEO of Ocean Networks Canada. We're going to talk about the oceans today. Kate, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks for inviting me. This is going to be an, a fascinating conversation. I mean, we're surrounded by water. We live with water all the time, but we know so little about it. But your organization, Ocean Networks Canada, uh, is, has an affiliation with UVic, and you are studying our oceans. So as I said to you before, let's pretend that we sit down and we're total strangers on an airplane. And I turn to you and say, hi, Kate, what do you do? And what would your answer be? Well, the first thing I would say is one of the most important jobs we have as citizens on the planet is to observe our Earth. And so what I do is I lead an exceptional team that observes the ocean 24 seven so we can understand it, possibly help it become healthier, but most importantly, help to uh, protect it and, and be sure that we have the ocean help us as the climate changes our planet. Uh, yeah, being, being individuals that can't breathe underwater, <laughs> it, it's only been recently that we've been able to go to the bottom of the oceans and see what's there. So tell me about the technology that has enabled that with us. Mm -hmm. Well, it was several years ago, um, there were two mavericks here at University of Victoria, Chris Barnes and Verena Tunnicliffe, who had this idea with another scientist in, in, the, in the United States to take telecommunication cables and utilize them to connect sensors to them so that we could have data real time from the deepest part of the ocean and in the water column 24 seven. It was a new paradigm in trying to study the ocean because previously to this technology, scientists would get two, maybe two weeks, three weeks a year at sea, study one little footprint of the ocean where it, it changes every day, but they get that picture of that one or two week period, go back, analyze it for two years and then publish. Just to give you an example, understanding the deep water circulation of the planet using the ship based approach took more than four decades. Wow. That's how long it took just to understand how the deep water circulated on our planet. It, it's, it's remarkable that we know so little about the ocean. I wonder what, what would it look like if suddenly the oceans all disappeared for a day? We could just sort of see what was down there, what the seabed looked like. What would that look like? Oh, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, it's the longest mountain chain in the world, completely connected all over the ocean floor. And it's, it, if, you take a, if you look at a baseball, it's like the seams on a baseball. It is covering the entire planet. Some of the deepest, deepest canyons, deeper than the Grand Canyon, many of them, you would see hot vents spewing, you know, 320 degrees sea water coming out of the seafloor. There's one right off our coast uh, in, in a marine protected area. You'd see gas bubbling out of the seafloor. And unfortunately, if you did, uh, if you did lose all the water, there'd be a lot of dead things. On the bottom. Yes, there would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it would be a fantastic view. And it's so, uh, it's so fortunate that we have cameras on our observatory so we can actually take a look at some of these very unique areas on our planet. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the deepest part of the oceans is near Philippines, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, near the Mar this is Marianas Trench, near the, near the Philippine yeah. Trench. So can you imagine what it would have been like all of those years ago when all of these devices suddenly made it possible for people to see the deeps of the oceans, things that had never been seen before by human eyes? What would that have possibly been like? And wouldn't you have loved to be there? But what would that have been like for them? I mean, for the first time yeah. in terms of seeing things? Well, I, I can only share what my excitement um, when I was a young engineer scientist, um, I had the opportunity to go down to the bottom of the ocean in Alvin and look out the porthole. I mean, I was beside myself when I came back up to the surface. It was just truly remarkable. I mean, it, it, it changes your life when you can actually see another part of the planet that no one else has ever seen. It's just, it's hard to describe. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I mean, the, 
the the amount of light that reaches into the oceans is very little. It's like just a fraction because the rest of it is completely pitch black, right? It is, except for the fact that there's a lot of there's life forms that are that bio, bio, have bioluminescence, so they actually light up, and so it's a limited amount of light. But yes, most sunlight does not penetrate deeper than you know 100 to 150 meters, depending on the clarity of the water. But the deep ocean has this this these life forms that have bioluminescence, and it's, and we're just starting to study that part of the deep ocean because uh, we've installed a neutrino observatory for the for astrophysicists to, to understand the, the origin of the universe, but they have a dual purpose. We can actually measure bioluminescence. So we'll begin to understand the light activity generated by animals in the deep ocean. So without this being a dumb question, but I used to make a living asking dumb questions, what is it about organisms that don't need light to survive? Like, what are they? Yeah. Well, it's, you're talking about photosynthesis, you know, but most of what we know about comes from the sun and the plants and the photosynthesis for, for, for actually um, giving life to, to what we see on land. But it, it, I'll give you an example. At the Endeavor segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge, where we monitor uh, black smokers, um, these, they're life forms that feed on the chemistry. So they're chemosynthetic life forms. And it's, it's gases that would kill us, mm -hmm. but these these life forms actually thrive in these environments and it's an incredibly dynamic atmosphere. It's, it's 320 to 360 degrees sea water, rich in minerals. So it looks like it's called black smokers because the water's coming out of the seafloor like black smoke. Oh, okay. But it's so hot when it hits the cold ocean water, it, the minerals precipitate and form these giant smokers, black smokers, tens of meters tall. And initially they're barren and then the life finds them and they, they, they accumulate on these, on these tall towers and they all live on the chemistry of these gases that are coming out of the, out of the uh, seafloor. So it's remarkable. It's, it's some scientists study for to understand the origin of, of the planet or uh, excuse me, life on the planet. We've got a bit of a concept of what it looks like down there through the observation that your organization has done and others too. I want to talk next about what it sounds like down there. Our guest on Chamber Chats is today, uh, today rather, is Dr. Kate Moran. She is the president and CEO of Ocean Networks Canada, this remarkable world-class organization affiliated with UVic that's helping us all learn more about the oceans around the world. So what, when we talk about these depths of the sea, Kate, and we, we've talked a little bit about how dark it is, and the, and the, what does it sound like down there? Does it sound like anything? Oh, of course. I mean, uh, so obviously people know that uh, whales are, are, are make sounds mm -hmm. and they and sound travels far in the ocean. I mean, you, you can there's there's a there's a, a, a layer in the ocean that's deeper than about a kilometer. That's called the sound channel. You can have sound that travels across the entire Pacific so you can hear sounds from other parts of the ocean. But there's so many things that make noise, like in the coastal zone right now today, where there's a huge wind windstorm happening. Um, there'll be a incredible amount of noise formed just from the waves and, and the currents moving. Um, fish make noise, shrimps make noise, um, and of course, earthquakes make, make noise. Underwater landslides make noise. And then, of course, uh, we do. We, we operate ships and, and systems and we pile driving and all of that is the man-made noises. Now, in, in, in the heavily human impacted zones kind of dominate this, the soundscape. What's a hydrophone? Oh, it's an underwater microphone. Yeah. It's, it's it, you, we, they're specialized uh, so that they, you know, they, they can get wet and you can actually listen to all of these sounds. And, and we've, we're experts in them. We've helped, we've helped many Canadian companies become the best uh, hydrophone uh, manufacturers in the world. A lot of the hydrophones that are now operating for science and other purposes around the globe are manufactured right here in Canada, some of them here on Vancouver Island. You know, we talk about all this amazing equipment and everything that we're learning from all of that stuff and the information that you're harvesting and gathering all the time. There's been a very significant investment in Ocean Networks Canada monetarily mm -hmm. just to keep things going. Tell me about that. Yeah, so um, first of all, we were, we were funded uh, through the Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, some other federal programs, money from the province to actually install this infrastructure. We're at a, around a $500 million investment. We've been operating now for 16 years. And uh, I'm so happy you're having us on check because I think people don't know that 
they have right here on Vancouver Island, they have a world-class ocean observatory right in their own backyard. And we're, we're, we, we've been in, the investment has been incredibly um, good. And so we, we sit in, at, at the top globally of the best telecommunication cable-based observatory in the world. And you know, when you talk about the ocean noise, the noise in the, in the seas right there, um, BC Ferries, for example, is one of the organizations that's really working hard to reduce their noise impact, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Um, one of the things they're doing, which is world leading, I would say, is they are building hybrid ferries. And these hybrid ferries, and once they, they can go completely electric, the, the noise reduction is remarkable. So that's, that's a future installation. They have them operating now. And, and they have been working on ways to reduce their noise by first, they've measured it through, through our systems. And so once you measure it, once you know what the issue is, you can begin to adjust it based on speed and, and where you actually uh, operate. But one of the important um, partnerships we have with BC Ferries is that on three of the ferry routes across the, across the uh, Salish Sea or the or this southern strait of Georgia, we have installed sensors right on the ferry. And we measure many, many properties of the surface ocean in, in this heavily human impacted waterway. And they are truly dedicated to, to ensuring that we are able to collect those data. And so that's a partnership that demonstrates their interest in ensuring that the ocean is, is healthy and, and remains that way in, in the future. And we are planning on installing those systems on all the hybrid ferries as well. Yeah, when you talk about the noise created by by shipping, by boats, by ski boats, by jet skis, whatever it might be. What was the condition in the oceans before shipping was motorized? In other words, when everything was under sail power, it must have been a whole different world yeah. in the oceans, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, it, it, it was obviously, there wasn't any, there wasn't, there was very little human in, uh, human noise that was generated. So that that's the pollution that we have to really attack now and we have to reduce. and. In our partnership with um, the Port of Vancouver several years ago, we installed what's called an ANSI standard um, underwater listening station. And it's a standard, you have to, because there's so much noise in the ocean, you have to calibrate these hydrophones on a regular basis to do things like measure precisely the noise of a ship. And so with partnerships with JASCO and the Port of Vancouver, we measured uh, thousands of ship sound source signatures. So it's every ship, like your fingerprint, is unique to that vessel. And with that information, the port and others are able to use that data to help reduce the noise in the strait. So we have to do that everywhere. But going back to pre-human impact, I mean, there, there's always been other impacts on the ocean, like, you know, whaling was a huge impact. And everyone wanted oil, their oil for lighting and, and, and energy source. It was, it's always been a place where people just extracted and we're finally getting to the stage where we understand we have to actually protect the ocean because it's needed in ways that we need better more than ever because of climate change. Yeah, progress was often measured by power and the access that we had to speed and all that sort of thing. But there, we were dumping stuff in the ocean for a long time. We have some very good stuff to talk about shortly, but I just want to cover this stuff off right now. Okay. When when did the epiphany happen that people realized, oh my gosh, we are screwing up the oceans? We're we're polluting them, the noise pollution, the amount of stuff that we dump in there, the garbage disposal. The, when, when did that light bulb go on over people's heads? I think it was actually at a time when I was in graduate school. So, you know, <laughs> just recently, you know, several sure, decades yeah. ago. <laughs> and, um, and I have to say it had to do with agriculture. Um, all of a sudden in the Gulf of Mexico, huge fishery at the time, it was seeing um, die-offs because Mississippi drained incredible amount of agricultural fields and there was this heavy, heavy load of fertilizers into the Gulf that caused low oxygen environments and killed off animals. And that was the beginning when, when it started to impact local people's lives, boom. And so that was kind of the beginning of it. The noise piece has, has just been recent. It's not been very, well appreciated until recently. And a lot of that's associated mainly in Canada with, with the fact that we have the Southern residents are, are endangered. And, you know, noise is one of the top three um, uh, issues that are causing that endangerment. But it, it's, it was just the, when it be begins to impact people's livelihoods, it's, that's, how it, it, that's how the wake up call happens. Yeah. 
Uh, we're going to talk next about Wally the Ocean Crawler on Chamber Chats. <laughs> Our guest today is Dr. Kate Moran. She is the president and CEO of Ocean Networks Canada, and we're talking about this remarkable organization that's an affiliate of, of uh, University of Victoria. Uh, Kate, we were talking just a second ago about when the first damage was actually realized in the waters. It was because it had an economic impact. But while all of that other damage was being incurred, where were the scientists of the day to talk about the fact that we were dumping sewage and pollutants and fertilizer and oil and all these things into the water? Was it, never just, it was never really picked up on anybody, right, until the economic impact came forward. Well, no, the scientists knew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's just they don't really – we we as a community, we go to conferences and talk to each other. Um, and it's it's not until, you know, the, the actual um, – the media actually started to begin to cover science more. I, I mean, and better. And so that, that hasn't been – you know, that hasn't happened – that ha that's just recently happened, I would yeah. say. So now there, there's an appreciation for, for the scientist's view, particularly, I, I keep talking about climate change. Um, but but actually, you know, if you think about climate, let me just speak about climate change for a second. Is that okay? Sure, please do. So in the late 1800s, um, some physicists did calculations. They made some measurements about, made some measurements in, in the physics world and were able to calculate uh, basically, what would happen if there was uh, a double amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? And they predicted exactly what we're seeing today, the temperature of the planet, eight, late 1800s. So the scientific community have, has known these kind of impacts, and yet they haven't been taken up by the public, um, some, somewhat because they didn't really understand the full impacts. But if you just take a step back, you'll see where there's been scientists warning about these things well before they're their impact in the economy. Yeah. I had referred to you just we were before we started recording. I, there was a bumper sticker I saw a short time ago that to me shows sort of some undereducation or misinterpretation of things by somebody. The bumper sticker says, when you've solved poverty, hunger, and homelessness, then talk to me about the climate. They're all mm -hmm. connected. They are all connected, aren't they? I, absolutely. And in fact, the climate climate change is impacting all of those things. Yeah. It's making poverty worse. It's making, it's forcing uh, immigrants. It's less food. It is, cl the climate change is making those problems worse. And so it's really, they're totally connected. And, you know, we used to always just speak about the environment, but it's, it's the climate change is about everything. It's about the economy. It's about education. It's about our future. It's about technology. It's, it's, it impacts everything. We also live on Vancouver Island where fishing is a big part of what we do. And certainly I, we've come a long way and the fishing industry worldwide is much, much better than it used to be. But that was a problem for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, there's been overfishing. Yeah, that's definitely been a problem. And it's, it's starting to be managed better because of satellite data. And there's a lot of organizations watching um, bad actors in that area. So we're getting there. It's still not where it should be uh, in terms of uh, in terms of protecting the species, that, especially the the food sources. Yeah, and I promised that we would talk about Wally the ocean crawler. Tell me about Wally. <laughs> oh, Wally is a is a crawler, just like the 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 rove, rover on Mars, actually. Uh, although it's much harder to operate in the ocean than on Mars because there's it's somewhat of a you know there's, there's 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 a little bit of a vacuum up there rather than high pressure and salt water. But it's a it's a crawler that uh, a scientist from Germany built and has been working off our coast, plugged in to one of our nodes. And scientists in Germany actually drive Wally on the seafloor to study this incredible area where there's um, bubbles coming out of the seafloor from gas hydrates. Hydrates are very interesting. It's it's methane hydrate that forms like it looks like dry ice, and it's a, an incredible. Um, formation in, in the world's oceans. And we have to understand it because it holds a lot of methane. If the ocean warms too much, a lot of that, that methane could be released and it could be another impact on, on greenhouse gases. So Wally is, is our um, guard watching gas hydrates off our coast. And so far they're stable. So uh, we want to make sure that Wally's still there guarding our gas hydrates and keeping them locked into the seafloor. Way to go, Wally. 
Ocean Networks Canada has how many sites across the planet where you're doing observation? Well, we have uh, many. We have at least six sites off of Vancouver Island. These are nodes, but then we have subnodes and subnodes. We have four in the in the Strait of Georgia ferries. We have we have uh, six locations on along the BC coast. Two locations in the Arctic. We're partnering now in in Labrador. Uh, we have a new observatory with our partners at Memorial University in Newfoundland, and we're partnering with uh, the Maritime Tribal Council in, in the Maritimes and partnering with others to help deliver their ocean observatory data as much as we can along all of our coastline, the longest in the world. Yeah. We have only basically just scratched the surface of the oceans in this conversation, Kate, so you have... Uh, uh, um, generously said that you would do another one of these podcasts with me. So the next one that you will see will be part two with Dr. Kate Moran from Ocean Networks Canada. Kate, thanks for your time today. We'll see you on the next one. And all of you, thanks for watching. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chats. <laughs>